evening, Mayor Jordan, City Council members, and guests. I am Ricky Stamps, your Program Director, and along with CEO Ken Cormier, the staff and residents of Butterfield, we welcome you this evening. Butterfield is a continuing care retirement community serving active senior adults in Northwest Arkansas. Butterfield has a long history with the City of Fayetteville due to our five founding Fayetteville churches, participation in several greater community programs, and many of our residents volunteer in the City of Fayetteville every single day. BTV is in its 26th year of operation and home to more than 380 residents. We are honored to host the third city town hall meeting in Ward 3 and hope each of you enjoy your visit on our campus. It is now my privilege to introduce to you Mayor of Fayetteville, Lionel Jordan. Can you all hear me? Good. Good. Well, it's wonderful to be here tonight, and we usually, the way we start off, I start off with what we've done in the last three months since the last town hall meeting. And then we will, you will have reports from each of the staff, and then we will entertain some comments and some questions at the end. Can everybody hear me good? Good. Okay. Since June, I, um, I want to, but before I do that, I want to introduce some folks that are here tonight. I see Mark Kenyon from Ward 2. He's an alderman. Stand up, Mark. I think they said Adela Gray was here. Adela, are you here? Yes. Ward 1. Bobby Farrell from Ward 3. Justin Tennant from Ward 3. So I want to uh, introduce you to those aldermen. They work very hard on the council. They make my job very, very easy for me, and so does the staff, but they do a great job, and I want to recognize them tonight. Um, since June, some of the things that we have done in the city of Fayetteville, the first thing that we did was in June we uh, cut the ribbon on the Razorback Greenway, which is a multi-use regional trail that will start on the south end of Fayetteville and go all the way through Bella Vista. That's going to be quite an addition to the region. We worked a couple of years on that, and now that's coming to fruition. We're going to be building that trail uh, this year. I'll be a little bit more on that later. Uh, in July, I think that one of the biggest events that we had was the 65th anniversary of AQ Chicken House. How many has eat at AQ Chicken House? Yes. Mm. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's one of the few places it's probably a little older than I am, so uh, it, it has really been a, a great restaurant so, uh, in, for the region. In August, uh, I had the privilege of speaking before the Arkansas Economic Development Commission, and they held their... Uh, their event for the first time in many years here in the city of Fayetteville. We, we, were, we were fortunate. Some of the things that we discussed in economic development in the last year, the, the uh, city of Fayetteville has developed over 240 new businesses and 850 jobs in a recession, so that's pretty good. Uh, also in August, I helped with the student move-in last week. So we have a record number of students coming into the city of Fayetteville. There will be over 25,000 students on the campus this year. Yes. And some really, really uh, great news is that uh, there's some road construction going on in the city of Fayetteville. I know that you all really like that, but we have got uh, infrastructure being built. Cato, uh, Garland, 15th, 265, and I-540 are all being worked on and, and being It'll probably take a year or two to get a lot of those projects done. The sales tax for the year, the city of Fevel's up over 5% uh, average for the year, and our HMR taxes are up 8.6% for the year, which is really, really fantastic. Uh, a fantastic report to give to you all as far as the sales taxes go. Um, I'm going to start with David. And uh, David, will, uh, he, he's water and sewer department head, and he will start off with a, a report on the deck and other issues. My name is David Jurgens. I'm the utilities director for the city and also the project manager for the parking deck project, and that's what I'm going to talk about for the next few minutes, just to give an update on that project. 
first of all, I'm just go through this, the sequence of what I'm going to talk about. The need for why we need a parking deck in the entertainment district. Some brief project objectives for what we're trying to accomplish with the project. The sites that are being considered. What the timeline is and uh, where we will take forward to the city council to consider those sites and then on through the construction timeline. How, those, uh, how the objectives integrate and the project integrates with the downtown master plan and then what actions are underway and completed, and then a very partial list of all of the selection criteria that when we come forward with the, the staff and consultant uh, uh, presentation to the council for site selection, a limited list of the criteria that will be considered at that time. First of all, the need. In, in 2011, based on city staff counts that we did over uh, both in fall and spring, the current parking in the downtown entertainment district was filled 208 days. Now we consider filled, it's, designed, or it's uh, defined by industry standards as more than 90% full. That allows for a little bit of transition in and out. I know that I personally, when I've gone down there both during weekday events and weekend events, if there's events at the Walton Arts Center, although the paid parking lots have been full and I've actually had to park on the street. Uh, it's kind of interesting. I have one of these little passes that help me get in as, uh, as part of my job. They didn't do any good with all the parking spaces being full. And I drove through th three lots 100% full. There is a need for parking. Additionally, that was substantiated back seven years ago by a study that was done in that same district, which identified that at that time there was a demand for parking. And there were two different parts of it. If the Walton Arts Center expanded, there was a need for approximately 1,200 spots. If they did not expand, there was a need for 800 spots. Now, there was some development underway that was, in, that was assumption at that time. Some of the development did occur, some did not but there are two major developments that are planned or underway at this time which will bring more demand for parking downtown. If you meet with the Walton Arts Center board, they had one very, very firm message to the city and that is we need more parking now. Not later, not in three years, not in five years, but we need more now. Thus, we need parking. Plus, if we were to delay this unduly, construction loans, construction costs, interest rates, are about as low as they're ever going to be right now. They're not going to get much lower. The most potential is that they would go up. We don't know when that'll happen, but we know that the only direction they'll go is up. So if we delay, then the only potential is more risk and more increase in prices. The objectives of the project, provide adequate parking for the citizens, their guests, and visitors to Fayetteville. Whatever they come for, be it a football game, be it to visit these 25,000 students that we have on campus this week, be it to go to an event at the Walton Art Center, be it to just go downtown or down in the entertainment district and play. We want to provide reasonable, safe, efficient parking to those residents so that when they show up in the downtown area or in the entertainment district area, they don't even think about parking. It's just there. It's not an end. It's the way to get to where they want to be. If it's invisible, it's accomplished its mission. Also, we plan to add approximately 300 spaces, and that's yet to be determined depending on the exact layout of the facilities, and the consultant team is working on determining those layouts as we speak, and there are several that are being considered. We want to plan for future expansions because, frankly, our goal is for downtown area, the entertainment district area, to continue to blossom. 20 years ago, the Walton Arts Center was just finishing construction. Now it is a viable area. The Dixon Street area had many, many more businesses that were not in use, many more buildings that were not in use. The businesses are doing great. HMR taxes are up. People are continuing to go there. Demand will only increase. So we want to plan for the long term, plan for additional parking and a plan for additional other venues. We want to integrate this into long range plans for the area. To that end, we spent many months working with uh, architects for the Walton Art Center who identified their expansion plans. And those expansion plans are pretty aggressive. They included short range plans, to expand the existing facilities to make them more competitive, more comfortable, more viable, more workable for, for groups that are coming in to give shows, as well as for guests and visitors to want to attend shows. But also they included in their mid-range plans, plans for an expanded theater. Details to be determined, but the architect hired by the Walton Art Center identified plans for an, expand, an expanded theater. So we need to plan for those expansions as well as the others in the business community. And finally, we want to be consistent with that downtown master plan because this is the guidance from the city council to move forward. And most of the downtown master plan criteria were actually incorporated into ordinance. And the city 
project will meet the city's ordinances. Areas being considered, we have the Walton Arts Center lot here on, that's the big parking lot for those that have been down there. We have space here in the theater lot. We had the south lot that the city council determined due to the size of the lot, the height of the structure, and the immediate, like this is, would, a structure there would be about 10 feet away from existing houses, that that was not viable. And then we have the east lot where the city council had actually made the same determination, but the Walton Arts Center board a few weeks ago requested that we relook that lot on the possibility of actually purchasing some land adjacent to the lot to see if we could build a larger footprint deck on a larger space and then possibly make it a viable alternative. Staff is still working that, that evaluation as we speak. Project timeline. Items in yellow have already been accomplished. We've done very much in the last year. And items in white are still underway and forthcoming. We approved a bond ordinance which sets up the financing for the project. It's nice to know you can get the money if you need to to build the project. We selected an architect engineering firm which includes both local architects and engineers as well as national expert consultants in the area. We awarded a design contract for the same. We then had the first real wrinkle come into the project when the Walton Arts Center selected an architect for their expansion. Like, this is really cool. I mean, this was really good. This was great because we want to integrate this facility with everybody that's there. The reason it became a wrinkle is because working with a brand new architect who didn't know anything about the area cost us some time, cost us a lot of work, but it's going to make a much better project because we want to make sure that everybody involved has full input and that this is integrated with the future. So we, we coordinated with them. We worked very closely with them. And the WAC, the Walton Arts Center board actually met a few weeks ago to discuss this very project. And really, their focus was not a deck. Their focus was, can we do the expansions to our facility that we're looking for in the next 5 to 15 years, A, with a deck on the theater lot, or B, with a deck not on the theater lot? Two different alternatives, because that lot that has the Walton Arts Center Theater building on it right now is one of the alternatives that we're considering for where to put a deck. Tight, close, screened by liner buildings may be the most viable alternative for this size deck. The conclusion of their architect and the conclusion as approved by the Walton Arts Center board was yes. They can do their expansions, including that medium-sized theater, with a deck on that lot, and it took a lot of integration to figure out how we might footprint that, or they might be able to do that, or they can also do that expansion with a deck that is not physically located on their lot. So basically their conclusion was that both alternatives will work. The WAC can do their expansions that they have planned with or without a deck physically located on that same lot. That was a big milestone. That was big information where we know now that we can integrate with them if that becomes the best alternative for the city council to decide or to choose. Future actions. Go forward to the city council next month, or correction, in October, possibly the end of September, but most likely in October, to actually have the city council make the site selection. We're going to take forward, as I said, some criteria, and we'll show a list here in a couple of minutes of some of the criteria, but a very rational approach of what are the pros and cons of each site so they can compare the two sites to make the most intelligent choice for the city moving forward. Issue bonds. When we've decided on a selection or on a site, when we know we've got a viable project, when we know it's affordable, buildable, then we can go forward with the financing. Award a design contract, open construction bids, and then start and complete construction. And we're looking at about an 18-month construction window for the project. It could be less. Kind of depends on how we build it and uh, what the structure is, how the structure is constructed, and who the contractor will be. Working in with the master plan, the mass downtown master plan was completed in 2004. These are some of the guidelines that the master plan identified. First of all, ensure that adequate supply of parking for future growth. If you can't park there, you're not going to come. You're going to get ticked off. You're going to drive down there, you're going to get ticked off, and you're going to leave. When I used to live in Washington, D.C. as a soldier, I drove downtown Cherry Blossom time, drove around for an hour, couldn't find a parking place, got ticked off, I left. Well, I, I learned out of that, fortunately. Never drive downtown D.C. again during the day. Take the stinking subway. It's a great system. but never drove downtown again. And I did see cherry blossoms the next year, so I was content. 
Parking shouldn't be placed on corner lots at key intersections. You don't want it right there on the corner because frankly, parking doesn't bring people to the downtown area or to the entertainment district area. It gives them the ability to do what they do once they're there. It's not the objective. It's a method to get to your objective and to enjoy the entertainment district. Facilities can, be, can have multiple different ownerships and we have some private parking lots down there. We have some that are managed by the uh, entertainment district or the Dixon, Di uh, Dixon Parking District, and then we have others that are public lots. Maximize on-street parking. If you've been down there lately, there's a lot of on-street parking. And we have maximized that that's available. Structured parking located mid-block kind of ties back with don't put it on key intersections, put it in the middle of the block so that again, it's not occupying the prime real estate in the entertainment district or downtown district area. And then finally, put in the liner buildings, which goes hand in hand with mid-block and don't occupy key intersections. Incorporate it all into the whole so that the entire area becomes a destination and the parking is functionally mostly pretty much invisible, both from view and from memory. You go in, you park, you do your thing. Parking shouldn't be part of your memory. Current actions. We've done a geotechnical report on the two large lots. The big parking lot is less suitable than the theater lot is. The theater lot has very solid foundation of, of uh, rock, solid rock. The other one has more fractured rock, more potential for voids. People may have heard about voids with the Washington County deck, created some significant problems for them. We're trying to avoid those problems and reduce those risks. Some, some basics on uh, the architects. We've been working with their architect. I think I pretty much covered everything that I've got up there, that the board has worked very closely and our architect has worked very closely with the city. We love that integrated work, great cooperation. Staff and consultant team then is working on right now as we speak potential preliminary layouts that will take forward to the water and correction to the uh, city council. The comparison matrix so that the city council can see all of the pros and cons of each site so they can make a very thoroughly well-informed factual based decision on what is their best alternative. And quite frankly, as the staff guy in charge of the project, I don't know what's going to be the best alternative. From what we've gone through thus far, it is just really close. Working on the theater lot is complicated, but very likely because of those complications, more expensive in some ways. Putting it on the large parking lot, you know, if we want to increase th uh, 300 parking spaces and we put a structure on top of 150 of them, then we need to replace those. So we're then building a 450 or parking space structure. So, you know, it's a very complicated math equation and we don't know the answer yet. We're still working through all of that. And then we are at the request of the Walton Arts Center Board. We're reevaluating that east lot, talking to adjacent owners to see the potential for possibly placing the deck on the east lot, but on an expanded footprint. Because the WAC board, when we talked about it, they agreed that the existing footprint was just too tall, too small, and right in the faces of people that live next door. But if we can expand the footprint, it may be a viable alternative. You know, I really don't want to run through the selection criteria list, but I expect most people in the back of the room can't read the screen. Uh, just to hit some highlights of the criteria that we're looking at. Cost of construction obviously is critical. We've got a budget. We don't have an un endless budget. We've got $5.5 million with which to build a deck. We're going to come up with the best structure available to fill that, to meet that budget. Uh, we've got impact on businesses, impact on homes, topography, how much utilities we have to do. Because, you know, if you put a five-story deck next to it, our happy firemen in the back of the room have to, might have to get up to the top floor. That means we can't have power lines in the way. Utilities are an issue. We pretty much know what's there, but it could be a challenge. Efficiency for the folks that come downtown to use the deck. And the deck is pretty cool because it's not a parking structure simply for, to serve cars like most of your roads are, nor is it a pedestrian structure like a walking area. It is an equal mix of both. You have to both travel to and from by foot and by car and frankly, by scooter and motorcycle and bicycle, equally well. So it's a little bit different from most things we, we civil engineers design. Impacts on revenues, because here again, if we build a deck that takes up 150 spaces, it's going to reduce our parking revenue, and it's going to make a much more, uh, a, a greater impact on customer comfort, because they're going to take away some spaces that people use regularly. So there's impact on customers, impact on current revenues, um, operational costs of the deck, how easy it is to get in and out, all of those plus many more criteria are what we're looking at. On that note, I hope that I've
giving you all the information that you like on the parking deck. When we get to the end of the whole, uh, uh, all the series of briefings, and uh, feel free to answer any or ask any questions. Thank, Thank you. you Aaron Garden, who's our new sustainability director for the city of Fayetteville, he has some report he'd like to get. Peter? Thank you very much, Mayor. Uh, I don't have a PowerPoint like David, um, <clears throat> so I'll save you the graphics. But uh, some of the things that my office is working on, uh, one of our key priorities is energy and uh, both trying to reduce the energy consumption that the city of Fayetteville uses so that we can be good stewards of the taxpayers' dollars, but also uh, outreach to the residents and businesses in the city of Fayetteville to help them reduce their energy consumption as well so that we can all um, have a little more money in our pockets to spend at some of our local businesses. Another key uh, initiative we're uh, targeting is fuel consumption and again trying to reduce uh, fuel consumption on city vehicles and then also trying to help our residents uh, figure out ways that they have to drive a little bit less uh, so that they again have more money in their pockets. Uh, one way we're trying to help folks um, drive a little bit less is by promoting uh, bicycling and walking more. Uh, that has the added benefit of uh, saving you money and getting you a little bit of exercise, um, helping to shed a few of those uh, pounds around the, the waistline and help, help control health care costs. Um, we are working right now with the University of Arkansas and their Applied Sustainability Center on bringing the first uh, statewide sustainability conference to Fayetteville. That'll be in October. Uh, it's reaching out to mayors and city councilmen all over the state, bringing them into Fayetteville, showing off many of the sustainable features that we have going on here in Fayetteville that we're really proud of. Um, we're just getting started on our next neighborhood plan that will be uh, out on West Weddington Drive. It's going to be a, a corridor study where we're looking at um, a uh, section of, of Weddington just west of the bypass and trying to come up with some um, some really groovy ideas for um, promoting some of the, the walking and biking and um, and developing that in a way that uh, that promotes the traditional tra town form and tries to adhere with the, the goals of City Plan 2030. Um, one of the final things that I'll tell you just a little bit about uh, is some of the work we've done with regard to recycling. And I've heard that uh, you guys have a really uh, awesome recycling program here at Butterfield um, Village. And uh, the city is, uh, has some recycling goals. We're, we're currently working on trying to, uh, to get to a diversion rate of 25%. Currently, I believe we're at a, a diversion rate of, of like 14%. So uh, what that means is only, f uh, let's see, 100 minus 14 would be 86 percent of the material that the waste that's generated in Fayetteville is going to the landfill. So we're trying to get it to where only 75 percent of the, the waste generated goes to the landfill. The other 25 percent gets recycled. So we're trying to up the residential recycling rate um, from 56 percent to 70 percent. We're trying to increase uh, commercial recycling. We're trying to increase multifamily recycling as well. Uh, and one of the ways we're doing that is right now we're doing some outreach to a, uh, an area of town that is underperforming in terms of recycling. We've been hitting the ground uh, all last week. Our staff, uh, I believe we had, what, six staff, Brian, and uh, 14 volunteers out um, targeting uh, 667 households. Um, we did a total of 328 um, surveys out there, and um, um, the preliminary um, we haven't counted the numbers from the surveys yet, but uh, our, our guys that, that, that pick up the recycling out in that neighborhood say just, you know, in this first week after doing that outreach, they're already seeing, uh, you know, more bins out on the street. So we're really excited about that. Um, that's, about, uh, that's about all that I have uh, for you tonight, Mayor. All right. Thank you, Pete. Mm -hmm. Next is uh, Chris Brown, our chief engineer. He's got some road projects he wants to talk about, I'm sure. And some of the things going on around town. Not sure if I have enough hands here. All right. Thanks, everybody. I'm Chris Brown. I'm the city engineer. I um, have several projects I'll talk to you about. I've uh, got some pictures here. Hopefully, everybody can see them. If you can't, uh, after the show, we can, uh, we can look at them again. Uh, start with... Some completed projects, uh, 2006, our transportation bond program was approved by voters, uh, and we began work on, on several of the projects then. Uh, we have completed some of them. 
uh, the uh, ever popular traffic calming, aka speed tables, uh, around the uh, Wilson Park neighborhood and Washington Willow neighborhoods. Uh, I'm sure, some some of y'all uh, appreciate those. <laughs> but that was part of the bond program. Uh, Zion Road up around Lowe's was completed in 2008. Uh, it's a nice project. Uh, Greg and North, a little small intersection project, but that has alleviated a, a bottleneck there, that right turn lane. Uh, College Avenue in the downtown area was also part of the bond program. And Mount Comfort, which was completed in 2011, that was about a $10 million project, a very large project, and uh, really helped the west side of town there. Uh, moving on to some of the construction projects we have going on. This is uh, Cato Springs Road, which is the south part of town, uh, down by the, uh, the Research and Technology Park. It is under construction. Hopefully it will be completed later this year. Uh, the roundabout at North Hills and Futural, I'm sure you all have read some about that. That's uh, just in front of the hospital between the Medical Park and Washington Regional. Uh, I do have a picture of that. This is what it will look like. Um, just a couple of features of this. If you're coming from the west on the Fulbright Expressway uh, and you just want to go to Greg, which is over here, you will be able to bypass the roundabout and just go through and, and continue on Futural. Uh, so that'll allow the traffic, and we do have quite a bit of traffic that does want to make that movement, so you'll be able to go around the, the roundabout. Otherwise, you will have to go through the roundabout. Um, it is, uh, it's about 100 feet in diameter, so from here to here, and this is the, this is the central island. Sorry, wrong button. Um, this is the central island here, and uh, of course, if, if any of y'all have gone through a roundabout, it's pretty simple. You come up, you turn to the right, you go around, and then you go out to the leg, that, uh, whichever leg you're, you're wanting to go to. Uh, I mentioned the central island. We are going to, uh, this is what the central island will look like. So it will have some landscaping, uh, some rock walls. Uh, this area around here is actually a truck apron, so large vehicles will be able to, to go around. They may have to put their wheels up on this concrete apron, uh, but they will be able to navigate through this. Um, this is, uh, uh, is for aesthetics, but it also is functional. Uh, the, the, uh, the best way to, to uh, have the roundabout function is that you can't see all the way across it. That will help reduce speeds. Uh, roundabouts where you can see all the way across them, um, you just, you're, you're able to see what's going on and so uh, you, you can speed on through. Uh, this will help slow people down, keep the sight distances lower uh, to help the speeds be reduced. Uh, moving on, the, uh, the Highway 265 Mission to Joyce, that of course is under construction. That is a highway department project. The city is participating. We're paying about half of the construction cost. Uh, should be completed sometime late next year, maybe early 2014. Uh, and then 265 north of Joyce is uh, another highway department project uh, that will begin um, later this fall and uh, probably will be 2014 before that is completed. Highway 216 is the southeast part of town. That project, uh, we are starting utility relocation, uh, getting water and sewer lines and other utilities out of the way. And again, the highway department will be working on that project beginning in early, uh, that says late 2012, and then be completed in early 2014 as well. It's kind of a recurring theme here, starting, starting now and ending in 2014. Uh, Highway 112, which is in front of the, uh, just north of the university, uh, this will be uh, beginning, and uh, the utilities are under, underway. You guys might have seen that. Uh, this road work will begin in 2013 and then be completed in 2014. And finally, the Highway 71B flyover, which I've said is, uh, has been a rumor for many years. We really hope it's going to be a reality here very, very soon. We actually have into the highway department right now a request to go ahead and advertise. We've got all the plans completed, everything is done, uh, so we have asked for authorization to advertise. We have federal money for this project. Uh, it's a total of, between the roundabout and the flyover, about, about uh, $7.5 million of federal money. 
which is great, of course, but uh, the hoops that we've had to jump through in order to get this project ready to go uh, have taken us several, several years to, to get through. Uh, I do have a picture of this. Uh, and essentially, if you are on Highway 71B, which is here, and this is Millsap, and if you want to get to the Fulbright Expressway, you'll be able to get into a lane here, fly over all of these roads, and get on the Fulbright Expressway. <laughs> yes, that's exactly what we say. Uh, at, alternatively, if you uh, decide you need something to eat or want to do a little bit of shopping, there will be an, an off-ramp right here that will take you into Mall Avenue. This is um, Olive Garden right here, so it will come in right here at Olive Garden. Very nice project, expensive project, about a $6 million construction project, uh, but will be a very nice project. Uh, this is just a, a depiction of how it will look. Uh, it's kind of a 3D model. Uh, also wanted to show you this. This is just a, cup, a couple of the um, piers that will hold up the bridge. Uh, the bridge will not be cut off like that. It'll actually extend. Uh, <laughs> this is... <laughs> Sorry, you guys knew that. I know you did. Uh, we, we did want to do something other than just a, a standard boring bridge. Uh, so these colors that you're showing, we're using earth tones. Uh, and this will be the shape of the piers. So uh, it's uh, something that we, we wanted to add. Didn't really add a lot of cost, but it will add some character to the bridge. Uh, so just to finish up, this is the uh, picture of all the projects that will be under construction over the next few years. So uh, as I like to say, if you want to get into and out or out of town, uh, don't even try. But as we get to the other side, 2014, uh, we'll, we'll definitely see some improvements and, and uh, see a benefit to all these projects. Um, I guess one last thing, there were some questions about Joyce Avenue out here. Um, there really are no plans for Joyce as far as expansion, widening, that sort of thing. Uh, it does need some rehab work on the concrete, and we will be looking at that project uh, in coming years, but no widening to speak of. Uh, so I, I think there were some questions about that. Okay. Chris, you might want to mention the historic Lafayette bridges. Oh, sure. Uh, I, I did not include that slide, but the Lafayette bridges uh, in the downtown area, Lafayette and Maple, uh, those bridges uh, are in the bond program as well. And uh, they are, uh, we do have federal funding for them as well, about a million dollars of federal funding. So we're working through the procurement to hire an engineer uh, to begin the design on that. Uh, it's probably going to take a couple of years to get through that design process and uh, then we'll move forward to construction. All right. Thank you, Chris. Okay, next we have Matt Mihalovich to talk a little bit about the trails. He's our trails director. Matt? Yeah, hi. Thank you, Mayor. Um, as Mayor mentioned, I'm Matt Mihalovich, the trails coordinator for the city of Fayetteville. I'm um, going to go over a few projects we have. Um, but first, how many of you have been on a trail? I figured there'd be a big hand sh showing here. Um, you guys have great access to Mud Creek Trail. So just encourage you that haven't, get, get on out there and enjoy it, especially with the cooler weather that's now finally here. Um, so anyway, we're continually expanding the network of trails. Um, so we have a listing here for next year. Currently, the Lake Fayetteville Trail, which, which has four and a half miles of paved trail currently, but it ends on the south side. And so we're building the last mile that brings it around to Veterans Memorial Park. So have any of you been out on Lake Fayetteville Trail? Yeah, it's a real gem out there. So this will be nice so you can complete that loop. And so that's under construction. Hopefully early around spring of next year we'll have it all finished there. So that's where the crew is. Um, and we just opened the Meadow Valley Trail, which is over by Garland and the University Farm. And that's a nice trail that's going to connect the west side of Fayetteville, uh, west of 540. We cut ribbon on that last week. Um, so some other projects we have, um, as the mayor mentioned, the Razorback Regional Greenway is a 36-mile trail that's going to go from South Fayetteville all the way up to north of Bella Vista. I mean, sorry, Bentonville. Um, and that sections that are under construction in Fayetteville, we have two really good pieces of that. And one of them on the north side will, will run along through Johnson and along Clear Creek. And that's going to connect Skull Creek Trail, where Mud Creek and Skull Creek Trail come together. It'll go up along Clear Creek and meet up with Lake Fayetteville. Um, so that's one project that's going to be starting soon, and that's going to be a really nice section of trail. There's 
just, just really beautiful through there. Um, and then on the south side of town, we also have an extension to continue the Frisco Trail down to Walker Park. So that's going to be a really nice uh, piece of trail and connects up some more trails to the south, including the Zala Gee Trail, which has a funny name, but that uh, it stands for the Cherokee Trail, and that was part of the Trail of Tears. So in honor of that, we've named it the Zala Gee Trail. And then we also have the Town Branch Trail a little bit further to the south of that that um, is going to be under construction soon. And that's at the Research Technology Park for the University of Arkansas, if you're familiar with that, just south of 15th Street. So I'm going to go into a little more detail on these trails. But we have a busy year coming up. We expect actually next year to build the most number of miles of trail that we have ever done in Fayetteville. So it's going to be an exciting year with the combination of the Razorback Regional Greenway. So I mentioned Meadow Valley Trail here is completed August 8th. That's a two-mile trail. And it goes through the, the farm field, so it's really a nice experience. I mean, you have the horses and the livestock around, and it's just really neat feel. Uh, mentioned Lake Fayetteville here. This is showing the, the last one mile. We did get a grant to help us out with the construction from the highway department for $80,000. And in, in addition, an, an anonymous donor uh, donated four and a half acres of land to the south so that we could make the trail uh, less steep and it'll be ADA compliant. Um, for the south part. As, as many of you know, that southern portion has some steep little ravines. So we're going to be able to make it a lot flatter by going to the south. Um, here's a picture of the Razorback Regional Greenway. Uh, there are, I think, seven different contracts that are going out. And I believe two are under construction right now. And they hope to bid out uh, the, pretty much all the rest of them by the end of this year and then be in construction all next year and then have it finished by 2014. Um, this is a more detailed picture of the Clear Creek Trail that I was mentioning, connecting Lake Fayetteville Trail. You can see the blue line, the blue part is in Fayetteville, and the, the more pink is in Johnson. So we're partnering with the city of Johnson and the Johnson Clear Creek Association on that trail to get it, because it'll go through both cities. And that's about 2.63 miles long, so kind of a long one. And then, as I mentioned, the Frisco Trail Southern Extension, um, it's only half a mile, but it's a really, uh, it's got a lot going on with it, um, with the busy highways that it's going to cross, and uh, just a lot involved. And on this trail, we expect that, because it's part of the Razorback Regional Greenway, that it'll be completely funded through the Greenway, through private funding. So that's a real bonus. Okay, and that's all the slides. And I've, after the, the meeting, I guess we'll uh, be happy to answer any other questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Uh, the next person is uh, Connie Edmiston, our parks director, and she, she will give a presentation now. Good evening. Good evening. Is everyone here with me still? <laughs> well, we're ready to have a little bit of fun. I'm Connie Edmiston with Parks and Recreation, and my job is to help you have fun in our city. And I think from what everybody has talked about, you see that the quality, quality of life is very important to us to provide to our citizens. And each of you have, have your own idea of what you would like for us to provide to you. So I have a very busy job with, with everybody's uh, choices of how they want to recreate. Um, a lot of people like to utilize our swimming pool and, and our lakes for fishing. Some people love to see just all the green space that we preserve throughout our city. They might want to go out fishing or sailboating at Lake Fayetteville, Lake Sequoia, Lake Wilson. Uh, just go hiking on a trail, go bird watching, uh, go watch a, a child go pl uh, be playing soccer, or maybe even participate in our softball program. So we have many programs that were designed just for you. I know we have a person out in the audience that I have seen everywhere swimming, I think, and she can really burn a bike up, even though it might be a stationary bike, but she really puts the miles on it. And Mrs. Schultz, would you come up? I'd love to give you this active Fayetteville. <laughs> you can put your swimming towel and flip-flops in there. You're welcome. You're welcome. 
think many of you have seen her out there. <laughs> we have 70 parks for you to enjoy in over 3,400 acres of land. So there's lots and lots that goes on with us. We have three lakes, which are for fishing and boating. And does anybody, has anybody gone fishing at any of one of our lakes? Anyone gone fi We don't have a fisherman. In oh, right back there. I've got, Lindsley, you and the, uh, we got to, yeah, I'm not going to throw it that far, I'm afraid. <laughs> Would you give that visor to the fisherman back there? Awesome. Wonderful. Our parks basically, they open at sunrise and they close at 11 p.m., except for our lakes. The fishermen, we've got to get them back in before sunset so they can go fry their fish. So the lakes open from sunrise to sunset. Uh, we do have 13 pavilions in which you can get online or just give us a call that are free to you it, to schedule for a party, a birthday party, a reunion, just a social get together and it's free. So come to us and we can help you with your big needs. That way you don't have to get your house all ready and we have a pavilion in a very nice setting for your party. We do have a Wi-Fi park. Does anybody know where that is located at? Like kind of in the center of the city? The square, who said square? Lindsley? All right. <laughs> Downtown Square is, has free Wi-Fi to you. We also have many other gardens, like Wilson Park. Um, we have two greenhouses. Are you all aware of our greenhouses? Who's up? Oh, I see a lady right there in the striped shirt there. She enjoys our, our greenhouses. One's at Wilson Park and one's at Mount Sequoia Gardens that enables our horticulturists to grow many of their plant material out there. And they just do an awesome job throughout our city, making it look beautiful. A lot of the landscape beds, Joyce Boulevard is your closest. Um, our horticulturists are at work. The downtown square gardens, they work on that. Just, they're all over the city. We also have some community gardens that we started this year for people to get together and to grow their own gardens and we provide them with a spot. We have them at Jefferson Park and at Walker Park and they have gone over extremely well. I talked a little bit about the programs. Of course, it's fall and we're thinking about football and for some people it's soccer. We have over 1,300 kids that are out there playing soccer. We start up this Friday night. so. It will be crazy at the Lewis soccer field with lots of kids having lots of fun. We also have an adult kickball league going on in the summer league, and I just came from it. They're starting on the championship tournament, so it's very exciting out there. Uh, we have like 32, 325 people that participate in co -rec kickball, and it's like the old playground kickball game. We have flag football also going on. Fayetteville Parks and Recreation, we operate the Yvonne Richardson Community Center, which is located just south of the square, kind of southeast of the square. And for them, we, we have pickleball, which a lot of senior citizens and a lot of citizens at, at most love to play that game. And it's, it's there three different days that you can come. We also have a little community garden there for the kids. Uh, we have a youth wrestling club, and it's not for adult, but you can come watch them. We've got about 50 kids that uh, participate in that a couple of days a week. And we also do a tutoring there to help the kids to do the best that they can in their schoolwork. Once each month, the last Monday of every month, we have a program at the White Yvonne Richardson Center that is called um, the Life Source Food Basket. And we feed people, it's free, and they get to take home a basket of food also. So that's a very important program that we do provide to the community there. We are having a banquet, which is on the 28th of this month. It starts at six o'clock. If you're interested in coming to help provide funds for our Yvonne Richardson Center, Mike, Coach Mike Anderson will be there 
to, to give the keys, the keynote speaker, and also Nolan Rich Richardson will be present at that. So I would like to personally invite you to come to, um, to that event. You can call the parks office and we'll get you some tickets if you're interested in that. One thing our city does is we do give money to the Fayetteville Boys and Girls Club to provide programs for those kids and family. We also give money to the Walker Park Senior um, Adult and Activity Center uh, funding. Does anyone know of any program that, that we do there? Oh, what'd you say? There's a line dance. We've got a line dancer in the crowd. Awesome. Yeah, they have, it, they have many exercise classes, yoga, zamba, tai chi, uh, painting classes, wee bowling, many of those programs I know you all have here. And that's awesome, all the recreational programs that you have. They have games like, a, like as bingo and, and dominoes, bridge, canasta. Uh, they also operate our Meals on Wheels program for our, our, not only our city, but the surrounding um, Washington County also. They also give transportation for people who have medical appointments that they need to be taken to, or if they just wanna go get a haircut or go buy groceries or go shopping. They do provide transportation for that. They have a nice fitness room, a pool table, game room, exercise room. But that is a building that is on Walker Park. It is owned by the city, but we do contract the services out. We do have just a couple of capital projects going on uh, at St. Joseph Park, which is where the old St. Joseph church used to be. We have a park there and we're putting in a bench and a park sign and just kind of a terrace seating. It's kind of a just a, a nice little green space that you can go down and throw a frisbee or, or whatever. Uh, we're putting up some nice new swing sets um, at Goalie Park is coming up within the next month. And we're also renovating the Wilson Park swimming pool. So we're very excited over that project. And then in November, before we know it, it's Lights of the Ozark. We'll be putting up thousands of lights for your enjoyment. It'll be on from November the 17th. So mark that date on your calendar. We'll turn on all the lights, the 350,000 of LED lights, which Peter will be happy. And uh, that's all for your enjoyment throughout Christmas. And then the first day of the year, we turn them off. So come join us for that. There are many ways you can volunteer with Parks and Recreation. Uh, we do have a Parks and Recreation Advisory Board. If you're interested in seeing how our parks and programs develop, and we have an, an urban forestry board as well as an active transportation board that helps with um, mats, trails, and sidewalks and all. We have a trail tracker program to have, have you all seen the trail trackers out on the, out on, on the uh, trail system? That's very important. We had one trail tracker, Dave Bowman, that hit his 3,000 mile uh, time in for us, so that's, that's wonderful. Uh, we have coaches, many things that we that that we need help in order to provide for all 75,000 plus people here in our city. Our city does have a one cent hotel, motel, restaurant tax. So whenever you eat out, one cent of every dollar is going to parks and recreation, and we really appreciate it. So please, no more homemade food. Don't have anybody over. You take them out to eat. Don't let anybody come stay with you. They need to stay in our hotels because that helps Parks and Recreation. <laughs> uh, we also have um, a donation program in which you can donate funding for a memorial bench or a tree or a bike rack, a water fountain, about anything. So we'll work with you. But very proud of our city. Uh, Butterfield Trail, you all have a great community here. We're, we're glad you're part of our trail system and anything that we can do to help you or if you have any questions, please call us. Okay, that's the reports from the staff. So now we will take some time to take whatever questions that you might have and we'll try to answer those tonight. We don't have an answer, we will get back to you, okay? 
So who would like to be first? Come up and introduce yourself. voter in this ward and a previous justice of peace of Washington County. Uh, I think the city is to be commended for the compost operation that it has down at the uh, recycling area. However, for the small home gardener or uh, flower person uh, that does not own a pickup truck, they are frozen out of the possibility of getting any of this compost. I suggest that the city strongly consider setting up a bagging operation so that there would be bags of compost available for sale as well as by pickup truckload. So, Mr. Coffer, I want to be sure I got that right. So you're talking about a compost bagging system where we could so let you have a bag. I like that. Thank you. Thank you. Who else? Yes, two. Hi, my name is Terry Coberly, and I am a, a Ward 4 resident. And I'm not sure what the ISO rating is for the city of Fayetteville, but I'm concerned a little bit about too many speed bumps. Um, I know that they are normally for slowing down traffic but I'm wondering if there's a different way that maybe we could do that uh, so our fire and police could respond more quickly to uh, fires and emergencies. And that's well, I can tell you this, we don't have any more money budgeted for any more speed tables in town, so I think, yeah. <laughs> so, so I know Jeremy might be able to address that. We do different traffic calming now than what this Jeremy paid from the planning department. I'm Jeremy Pate with Development Services. Um, I think you're right. We we look at a lot of different options now other than just speed tables for traffic calming. So we have a toolkit or a toolbox of options that we look at. Primarily, we look at the context. You know, not every street is, is um, the same. And so what we want to do a better job, I think, of in the future is looking at the context of each street and seeing whether it's a horizontal deflection, a vertical deflection, or landscape islands, or narrowing a street at times, adding bike lanes at times can slow traffic. So there are a lot of different ways, and I think we're doing hopefully a better job of, of looking at all those options now. Thank you. Sure. All right, who would be next? And the other thing is in line of the, the speed bumps. I don't think they can Okay. I'm Mary Jean Place, and I'm a new resident at Butterfield Trails. And being new to Fayetteville, the one thing I would appreciate is if the speed bumps and things were painted, because there are many that are in disrepair. Huh. My car picks them up before I do. Okay. So, And the other thing is, too, that the signs that warn you that there is a speed bump have many trees growing over the sign. So for those who are residents here long term, they know where they are. But for new residents, it's always a shock that you hit that bump. And you only hit it a couple of times and then you realize it. But sometimes I forget. So I would like if those bumps were painted. Okay, so we want to properly uh, mark the speed bumps and when it comes time to replace them, not replace them at all. Well, <laughs> <laughs> that's your decision. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Who else? My name is Joe Masaki. I'm a resident here in Butterfield Trail Village. Oh. Uh, one, one question. Is the city of Fayetteville involved in any way in insect or mosquito control? And if so, uh, is it improving or are you going to do something about it? Well, I know that we're not putting any pesticides out there right now that I know of. Is Connie, do you? Yeah. No. I just read on. I just read online last night. Um, you can try this out for yourself. But vitamin B B one is supposedly makes you just a little bit less uh, tasty than the guy next to you to mosquitoes. So you might try that uh, out as an option for repelling them. 
you, you can't <laughs> yeah, spend vitamin D around down ahead. on Mud Creek Trail. <laughs> there, there is a problem with mosquitoes, yeah. and as you know, this year there's been an infestation and a serious problem with West Nile disease. And that, I'm just asking, is there anything that can be done? Is there anything that is being done? Okay. Does anybody know of anything? Terry. We, hang on, everybody. He's coming. This is Terry Guller for Transportation. Yes, I'm Terry Gully. I'm the Transportation Director. Uh, previously, in, in the past, when there was a last uh, kind of a fear of West Nile several years ago, probably seven or eight years ago, we did treat standing water with some uh, granulars that would uh, prevent the mosquitoes from hatching out. Uh, we did that then. We've not had, I've not had one request. My division usually handles that. And we have not had one request this year for anything like that. Have not seen a lot, have not had a lot of concerns from the citizens thus far. I mean, if, if that's the case, you need to call the transportation division. If you feel like you have something, we can look at uh, coming up with something that we can treat the standing water. But in the last month or two, we hadn't had any standing water that I could find. <laughs> so uh, that's kind of an update what we've done in the past. It was kind of like the slow growing uh, grass. I believe Alderman Farrell asked me about that a few weeks ago, and I said right now it's all slow growing grass in the city of Fayetteville. So, uh, what other what other questions do we have? I'm Dan Cootie, and thank you all for coming, and thank you all for being here tonight. This is an excellent exercise, and I appreciate Mayor and the, and the City Council and doing the City staff doing this because it's a good way to get a lot of information out. Uh, I want to ask one question, but quickly, Terry Coberly asked about the ISO rating, and that's a lot more than just speed tables, which is a whole different situation in town. But the ISO can, is, uh, is about how fire departments are rated as far as water pressure, police personnel, full-time kind of equipment to get your rating as good as you can that brings your insurance rates down so it's a very broad range of information that goes into an ISO rating but the question I have uh, for it was bacillus the thermaxis I think that Terry Cole, uh, that uh, Terry Gully was talking about to control mosquitoes is really bacteria that basically kills the larva but the question I have for the city staff and the mayor is uh, and I know they're familiar with this the senior center down here on the south side of town we cut the ribbon on that in 2002 it immediately filled up it's a great facility I'm sure how many of you have been to the senior center in the south side of town? Have many of you go down there? It's a great facility. A lot of folks who can't come out here do take advantage of that facility, and it is bursting at the seams. There are 10,000 people every day retiring in America, and they're wanting to retire to places just like Payable. So we see an explosion in the senior population base, and, that, and seniors are a very important element of this community. Now, the uh, the senior center down there is basically overcrowded with people trying to get into the exercise program and it needs to be expanded and I would like to see the city consider one of these days either expanding the senior center very dramatically or looking at doing what Rogers has done with their wellness center and basically trying to develop a really first-class wellness center here thank you all very much thank you um, yeah. I'm Aubrey Shepard <coughs> Excuse me, I've seen a couple of you down there, probably several that I can't see from here at the senior center. Some days there are only 40 people show up for lunch right now. And it's not really very crowded. There are certain classes that would like to have a bigger room. But you know what? When this thing was built a decade ago, <coughs> the biggest complaint I've heard from first time visitors over the years. Why does it have a at least two-story ceiling that you can't even change light bulbs? So maybe it's the first architect that wasted a lot of space and money on that facility. It's beautiful, and it's run well. <coughs> Excuse me. But uh, I'm not sure the city can afford to enlarge it right now with the budget problems we have. Thank you. 
But I do know one thing. I met with the head of the senior center down there, which is Leanne Giesler, and we talked about some repairs to be on the north side. And then we looked at making improvements to the kitchen area down there, and, and there's some stuff that we can do right now. So that's some of the things that we're working on. And I, I would, I know that I volunteer on for Meals on Wheels, and I know a lot of you are familiar with that. I just ran a route last week, and, and that's really a great program. So um, we're looking at making some repairs and improvements to that area down there. But it's it's... It's like I always tell folks that we have so much coming in and so much going out. And my job is to keep us between the road ditches, and sometimes that, that's a little tough. And and you know we but we're looking to make improvements down there. So you know the senior citizens are very high on my list of, of priorities. I want you to know that. So what? Who else? Gordon Marks from Butterfield. Uh, incineration. Are we? Uh going to get an incinerator eventually, or has there been a study since 1989 or something? Well, I, I don't know. That incinerator didn't work out really well for us a few years ago, so so I don't know of anything. Does anybody, David, do you know of any? At the current, at the current time, we have not considered anything with incineration. We have a much greater focus on diversion from taking to landfills and uh, diverting into recycling programs. Uh, with that being the focus, we are doing significant reduction in the volume of trash that goes to the landfill, uh, and we heard some of the reports earlier this evening on how uh, that is being successful and how we are moving forward. So our primary focus is not incineration, but is on diversion of waste so that it doesn't go to any kind of waste where it actually goes into a reuse or a recycling type program. I know you might want to mention the uh, biosolids that uh, operation at have. In, in a semi-related area, uh, a year ago, we were still processing all of our biosolids, which is the, the solid byproduct of wastewater treatment, and it was all going to the landfill. Uh, we have now completed two separate construction projects, which allows us to dry that through two processes, first time in, ever in the country that these two have been married together. The first one is a solar drying process, whereby we use solar power to uh, dry the product as much as possible. That turns it into a, a product that we can then land apply on some fields. Uh, then further, we are heating some with a thermal dryer, which allows the product that is one-tenth as dry as the original product, and that product can then be applied anywhere as a fertilizer, and we are, in fact, selling that product in bulk as a, uh, as a wholesale fertilizer product. So uh, it's related to the question of incineration. We are not incinerating the project we are, product. We are simply drying it, but then we are now selling it, bringing an additional revenue stream into the city. Okay. Who else? Yes. In Lejeune, and I'm retired from housing and urban development, and I was the first person to move people into the Hillcrest Towers, low-income oh. people. Oh. And since we're on this subject, is there any allocation made to do anything to help Hillcrest Towers? or any of the low-income housing for better facilities than what they have now. To my knowledge, it's the same as it was back in the early 70s. Well, um, Jeremy, do you, Yolanda is with... Uh, I know one thing that we did down Hillcrest Towers a few years ago, we did the lights program down there where we changed out all the lights in that, which saved them approximately, I don't know, what was about... 20 some odd percent on their utility bills down there or something like that so that's one of the the first thing we did and we did that with the volunteer effort which i know i work ah sorry we changed out with more energy efficient light bulbs down at the hillcrest towers is one of the things that that we did and i worked with the student organization on on the university of arkansas campus which saved the seniors down there or the people living in that area at least 25 percent but i know yolanda's been very involved in the uh uh, sustainable housing uh, group, and, and she can tell you a little bit about that. Okay, I think uh, pretty much you're asking as far as public housing, and uh, the funding for public housing, as you know, since you worked with them, it comes, it's directly to the public housing effort through the federal government, through HUD. So they do have plans, and they have an excellent board, and they're working to actually make improvements. They are working now at Lewis Plaza to actually replace part of that section there. They're working to improve the high-rise. They've had in the works now, as you all probably have noticed, the exterior 
is has had some issues. So they're trying to develop a plan to take care of that so it doesn't look... I mean, there's nothing structurally wrong with the building. It, it's just leaking a little bit, the, the mortar. And so they're trying to, to come up with a plan to get that taken care of. And Willow Heights, they've also had some improvements there. We have provided through CDBG funding, which is also HUD funding that the city receives, we added a classroom there to assist with the individuals that, you know, daycare and the Head Start. And so we, we actually provided a uh, classroom there. So there are always plans for improvement and, and we just need to keep working at it. Yes. That's right. Yes, yep. yes. That's so right. that's, uh, there's always constant improvements yeah. to the structure. Yeah. So there is now actually a cooling system mm -hmm. at the high rise. Yeah. Yeah, yes, and they've also added here. an emergency generator. Uh, yes, there there is at the at the center that's there at the high rise. There is an activities person there. Yes, and they have an excellent uh, center there. I'm sure if you all have gone there, and uh, they have great activities. So if you haven't been there, please please visit that senior center that's actually there at the high rise. It's wonderful. Okay, I, I think, is Chief Dayringer here tonight about the ISO ratings? Chief, would you come up and address that? We never did get an answer to that. Back there, Mayor. <clears throat> I'm David Dayringer, the fire chief. Our ISO rating is currently four, and the lower the number, the better the rating. And we are in line to be re rated sometime this early fall. So we've got the, uh, the man's going to come and uh, look at our water supply system and some of the infrastructure things that we've done with. Uh, the fire department and re-rate our city. Okay. All right. Fred? I'm Fred Vorsanger. I'm a resident here at Butterfield. A former mayor. I'm also on the Civil Service Commission. I want to thank all of you for the job you're doing in the job that's facing you, and I know of what I speak. We have a police department and a fire department, and you just met the fire chief. They're second to none. They're the best of the best. And I know the chiefs are here and Mayor, would you introduce them? Yes. It's Chief Dayringer. Yes. <laughs> Chief Dayringer from the fire. Chief Tabor's back there from the police department. They do do an excellent job. Mayor, in the back of the room, you have the, the firefighters that protect this part of the city. I apologize for my voice. Would you all stand up, the firefighters back there? Thank you Thanks, all. Fred. Thank you. <clears throat> Fred, would you like to speak again? No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who else? What else do y'all have? Come on. I'm Rick Meyer, and uh, many years ago, I had the privilege of establishing the Pollution Control Commission for the city of Fayetteville. But I've also worked with the highway department and I'm trying to search my memory, but if my memory serves me correctly, when they developed the 71 North, the business route, they also developed a way to integrate the north flowing traffic from college 
and from the bypass and make arrangements for the lanes to cross. You know, we go out there and do the do si -do as we try to turn into the mall or turn over to Joy Street, where you have cross the traffic weaving together. What are the plans to solve that problem in the, in the near future? And that can be very exciting. Yes, it can. <laughs> you become a flower within yourself, sort of. <laughs> Go ahead. Right, that's, I, I, I am familiar with that. Uh, the, that has been looked at by the highway department. It's been looked at by the city. Um, we talked about the flyover and the roundabout. Um, that was a, a federal earmark that we received for improvements along that corridor. Uh, and we looked at some, some potential improvements at the intersection of Joyce and, and 71B. Uh, we felt like these, the, the flyover and the roundabout um, were uh, priority projects over that. Um, the highway department has looked at something called a continuous flow intersection at that uh, intersection. Uh, they did a study of it. Uh, they never have funded it. Um, hopefully the flyover actually will help a lot with that intersection of Joyce and, and 71B. So uh, right now we're sort of waiting to see what the flyover, how it will impact the traffic, and uh, then see what improvements may need to be made to Joyce. Uh, but you're right, that weave, when you, when you have to go across two lanes of traffic in that short distance, uh, it's, it is very exciting. And uh, my wife got a ticket there, so I know that very, very, very well. Um, but it is, it is a, a weakness of the transportation network in that area, I certainly agree. Yeah. Um, somebody asked me to reintroduce the police chief, Greg Tabor, in the back. Would you stand up again? I don't think they... There we go. <laughs> oh, okay. We also have with us tonight, we have Sandra Smith, our city clerk. Would you stand up, Sandra? Where are you? Ah! And uh, we... Very good. Everybody hear that? She, Sandra was a, a village trail employee for four years. There you go. That's one of your own, folks. Uh, we also have with us tonight Kit Williams, who's our city attorney. Kit, would you stand up? All right. What else do we have? We've probably got about five more minutes. Then we're going to draw for, uh, I believe, a, a painting. Yes. Uh, that number will be. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, the county and the school boards have a, uh, allow some time for people to address their councils directly. Uh, but in Fayetteville, unless it's the way it's set up, unless your ward representative agrees with you or feels that it's worthy, uh, you can't just come up and address, publicly address the council on a, on a non-agenda item. And I'm wondering if you would consider allowing us to do that, maybe get two or three minutes uh, per person, just to, you know, spout an idea. So what you want to do, Jim, is to have more of an open mic at the council meetings to, to address a certain period of time. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. All right. Okay, let's take, a, let's take another question. Okay. One more. One more. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I'm Dixie Cole, and I'm a raising here. I've been here for 19 years. All right. And I'd like to thank all of you for coming and sharing all this information with us. We appreciate it so much. Well. And should you ever decide to retire to a retirement village, you're welcome That's to great. join us. <laughs>
Okay. Okay. Well, thank you all very much. Uh, you've been just wonderful tonight. I know that I, I would like to say one thing. There is a couple here, Andrew and Marie uh, Brewer, I believe. Are they here tonight? Yes. Well, you all celebrated 60 years of marriage, and uh, uh, I know that uh, is very special because my mom and dad celebrated 60 years of marriage in July, so congratulations on that. <laughs> and now I believe Lindsley has a drawing for the little painting up there. There you go. Who is, who is the painter? Beth is what she goes by. Art by Beth. Art by Beth. Art by Beth. <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh my goodness, it's me. No. Uh, the, the number is 61 68. Oh, wait. Let me read it again. Okay. Okay. Where? All right. Well, again, I, I certainly want to thank Butterfield Trail for having us here tonight. I'd like for the staff to stand up. City staff, if you're here tonight, would you stand up? Come on. Very good. Thank you all. So again, thank you for coming out tonight. It was absolutely wonderful. Until I see you again, have a great day, and I'll see you real soon. Thank you all. <laughs>